Let me show you the dog kind so you understand what's going on here. The dog family is a diverse group of 34 species, okay? And this is from the secular world. It is clear that the domestic dog originates from the wolf. And so you've got these different species of dogs. And you look at how different they are, but we recognize they're all dogs and even your domestic varieties. And they're saying something like that gave rise to your domestic species, even these. <laughs> you know, people say, how could that give rise to that? Isn't that evolution? Actually, it's the opposite of evolution because it involves a loss of information. It's a downhill change. It really is. Till you get to where a poodle is, a poodle has such limited information that if it lost any more, it would cease to exist. <laughs> it's really the end of the line when it comes to dogs. It is. I mean, it's sort of the bottom of the gene pool. Sorry about that. And of course, because of sin, it's got all sorts of mutations as well. Oh, and by the way, if there's any poodle lovers here, sorry, I apologize, but people say to me, but didn't God make poodles? How could he? Because when he made everything, it was very good. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, when you look at a poodle, it, a poodle is actually a degenerate, mutant, sin-cursed copy of the original. That's really <laughs> the best way of explaining it, okay? Now, what we notice is in this... Like, how, how do we breed the so-called purebred dogs? You know, like you saw, you know, poodles and so on, purebred dogs. Well, what we're doing is to say, oh, look at this dog here. It has, a, it has a particular, say, a flat nose. And this dog has a flat nose. Let's breed them together and get rid of all the genes for long noses and only get flat nosed dogs together. So you're eliminating variability. That's how we get our purebred dogs. And by the way, in doing that, we usually concentrate mutations because of sin, which is why if you have one of these purebred dogs, you have to take them to vets and get all sorts of you know injections and they have problems and they have all sorts of issues and that's what keeps vets in business are uh, the degenerate mutants so now how do you get these different species and things who's heard of the term natural selection heard of that okay natural selection adaptation those terms are used in the public school textbooks as examples of, you know, part of the evolutionary process. I want to show you when you correctly understand natural selection, speciation, adaptation, it's actually the opposite of evolution. The opposite. Because when you understand natural selection, it's a loss of information or it's information conserving process, but it is the opposite of evolution, which should be an information gaining process. We don't see information being gained. In fact, what we, what we find out there is this. You've got all these pools of information. You've got a pool of information for the dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind, and so on, the human kind, where humans are different to animals, of course, because we're made in the image of God. But you've got all these pools of information. Over time, you can see how those pools get distributed, and you can get different combinations, and you can get information lost. But if you're going to believe in evolution, you start with no information, and you've got to develop all these pools of information. We don't even see one bit of new information coming from matter. People, evolution is impossible. It did not happen, cannot happen. What they're taught in the public school textbooks is just plain, straight, wrong. That's why I wrote a book called The Lie, Evolution, because that's what it is. Now, let me show you how this works. We don't know how many dogs God made originally. Let's say he made two dogs, and they got married, had kids, and they got married, had kids, and they got married, had kids, and eventually you end up with lots of dogs. Now, <laughs> how do you get your different species of dogs? Well, in genetics, we have a convention where we label genes with letters. Big A, little A, big B, little B. You get the idea? Okay. Now, it's much more complicated, much more technical than this, but again, we're just looking at basic principles. So these are the basic genetic principles, Okay, even though it's much more complex. But... So here we have a male and female. So big A, big B, big C represent dominant genes. Little A, little B, little C represent recessive genes. Remember this? <laughs> Millions of years ago for some of you. But okay, so male and female. So okay, in sexual reproduction, you get one set of genes in the male, one from the female, fertilization. Wow, there's an individual. Stop and look at that individual for a moment. Does it have more information, less information, or the same amount of information as the parents? It's actually got less. It's got less variability because it no longer has a little a, little b, little c. You see that? Okay, now here's some other combinations. Now I like to use this one, little a, little a, little b, little b, little c, little c, to represent purebred dogs like poodles. Okay, because 
notice something. You've eliminated the variability, right? So think about this. If you breed a poodle with a poodle, what are you going to end up with? A poodle. That's it. See what I mean? End of the line. Pretty sad. Now, could you ever breed poodles together for as long as you could and get wolves back again? No. But theoretically, could you start with wolves if these were wolves? Could you start with wolves and get poodles again? And the answer is what? Yes. Ah, see, when you start to understand what's happening on the inside, you'll start to understand what's happening on the outside, right? So, the number of atoms in the universe, remember I said 10 to the 80th power, if you took one man and one woman from this audience, the number of children you could have without having two with the same combination of information is that number. Incredible amount of variability that God put in the gene pools of all the different kinds. So, two of each kind went on board Noah's Ark. You only need two dogs. So two, dog, two dogs go on Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark lands in the Middle East about 4,300 years ago. By the way, that means, as far as we're concerned, most of your fossils are about 4,300 years old, but that's another area. So then what happens? They come off the Ark, and we end up with lots of dogs. But they're not going to stay together. They're going to split up, and as they go to different places, what's going to happen? You're going to end up with different combinations of genes in different groups depending on who survives. Right? For instance, here we have two dogs that got off Noah's Ark. They fell in love, had two, they're only two. And they have an S, S gene for short hair, an L gene for long hair, S and L together makes a medium hair length dog. Okay, they have an offspring. Wow, we got something new. Look on the outside, it's got short hair. Wow, we got these finches that have short beaks. Wow, different species or, or whatever. This is evolution. People, I want you to look on the inside. Is there any new information there? In fact, does it have the same amount of information as the parents or less? Really, as far as variability is concerned, it's got less because it no longer has the L gene. You know what it's got new? A new combination of information that was already there. It's a new combination, not new information. And then you can have one that has the same combination as the parents and long hair. Oh, look, we got these finches with big beaks. Wow, that's evolution. Wait a minute. See, this is new. See, what students are told to look at, look, it's gained hair, it's got long hair, it's a gain, that's evolution, evolution gains things. When you look on the inside, you realize it's lost things. It's lost the S gene. It's worse off than the parents. Now, what they call natural selection and adaptation, this is what's really going on from a big picture perspective. Imagine these dogs move towards a cold climate. In a cold climate, those with um, medium hair and short hair get cold. <laughs> and then they die. <laughs> and now you're only left with dogs with L genes who are on their own, only produce dogs with what? L genes. So now you've got a group of dogs that can't produce short hair, medium hair again. If they're isolated from each other, you can see how, if, you know, and this is very simplistic, but you could get a different species that they call it, and actually, when I went to university, I was told these animals have developed these different species and evolution has gone so far, these can't even interbreed with these. Which means, by the way, it's the opposite of evolution. Now they can't even regain the information they once had. See, people are brainwashed into thinking the wrong way. Okay, imagine they go towards a hot climate. In a hot climate, those with long hair and medium hair overheat and they die. And now you're left with dogs with S genes who are on their own and produce dogs with what? S genes. So what's new? It's a new combination of already existing information. It has less information than the parents, which is the opposite of evolution. Natural selection is a downhill process, loss of information, conserving information. Evolution, in the molecules to man sense, requires new information addition of information, the opposite of what we observe. So when you see all these different species forming, whether dogs or finches, it has nothing to do with evolution. It's all just a reflection of the history and what happened when animals came off Noah's Ark, spread away from each other, split off in, in different diverse environments. And it's also the fact that there was an incredible p uh, potential in the gene pool of the dogs to start with which makes us realize Noah didn't need anywhere near the number of animals that went on the ark that we think. 
He only needed two cats. When it comes to elephants, elephants, we think the kind is at the order level because there's two orders of elephants, but it's the way that man arbitrarily classifies things. Only two elephants. You didn't need your stegomastodons and your mastodons and your Indian elephants and your African elephants and your mammoths. You just needed two of the elephant kind. And so it goes on. And people, you start to realize, wait a minute, we have been brainwashed into thinking things that just are not true. That's right, because we're not taught how to think correctly. The public school textbooks do not teach students correctly about these issues. What they teach them is wrong. 